Hey guys, this is Joe. Thanks for tuning in. And today, I want to shake up things a little bit and uh, rather than speak about something biblical, well, which perhaps it actually could be biblical, but uh, not in the uh, truer sense of the word, I would like to talk about uh, lights. Uh, in particular, Shabbat candles. Now, for most people, when they think about Shabbat candles, they're thinking about the wax variety, something such as this right here. Uh, but in ancient times, this is not the type of candle that was used to, uh, to light candles. They would rather use lamps, although they did have uh, candles made from animal fat and from beeswax. I do have a beeswax candle. Animal fat is a little harder to come by, but here's a uh, beeswax candle. But the main type of lamps that were used was the one that I have in my hand right here. This is a Herodian lamp. Now. This lamp dates from the Second Temple period, roughly from 35 BCE up until the destruction of the Temple in 7 BCE, and is found all throughout the land of Israel. This is a very simple and elegant lamp, and it was in distinction to the other lamps that were used during that time, i.e. the ones that were produced by non-Jews. Most of the lamps that were used, and I'll give an example right over here, had idolatrous imagery or alternatively had lewd acts being portrayed on the lamp. Now this is obviously not something that uh, you know a religious Jew would want in their house and even by today's standards most people wouldn't necessarily have such a lamp in, in their house but that was the way the Romans rolled. So Jews instead mass produced these type of lamps over here and this was the Shabbat candles of the day. Now actually from the law itself today we're accustomed to light two candles but uh, halakhically speaking one was sufficient. Now the way this lamp works if you look you see a big hole here it was in this hole that you would pour your oil and in this hole here the small hole this would be where you put your wick now, wicks could be made from many different things, and in fact, if you open up the uh, Mishnah in the second chapter uh, of Shabbat, you'll find a whole list of rules that govern how and what uh, can be used for lighting, uh, whether it is wicks or whether it is oil. Within the Mediterranean basin, generally, it was uh, olive oil although uh, exceptions uh, being in Egypt, any arid climate that wouldn't have olives or in Babylon, for example, olives were not uh, being used to light. But in areas such as Rome or the land of Israel, olive oil was a go-to oil. Now, the interesting thing about Shabbat candles is that this is something that throughout history, Jewish women have sacrificed much for. We find that no matter the level of observance or what was going on in terms of persecution throughout Jewish history, women have always striven to light candles at any cost. It's one of those things that have stuck. Now, the surprising thing about that is that this is not even a Torah commandment. And those aforementioned Mishnayot that we mentioned, the Mishnah, which is written in roughly about 200 of the Common Era, is the earliest rabbinic source for this commandment, this mitzvah. However, we'll see shortly that this is not the earliest source, or sources rather, that are found on the topic. We actually have Roman sources dating from just before the destruction of the Second Temple in Rome themselves that are referring to the lighting of Shabbat candles. The Mishnayot are interesting in that they are not discussing whether one should actually light candles or not. It's actually a discussion of what can be used and what can't be used, what kind of wicks, what kind of oil, or what other kinds of things that can be used to, uh, to do this mitzvah. And that would seemingly indicate that the mitzvah that is under discussion here is already much older and they don't need to talk about the hows and the, and, and, and the whens that this, uh, this custom developed. This is already an ancient custom within the Jewish people. Like I said, the Mishnah are coming from two, about 200 of the Common Era. 
The sources from the Romans are dated just before the destruction of the temple, roughly in the 60s of the Common Era. The first Latin writer to discuss the lighting of Shabbat candles was Seneca the Younger, who died in about 65 CE. He was a famous philosopher and statesman. And when we say die, he didn't die of natural causes. He was forced to uh, kill himself. That aside, he does write about the Jewish customs and have to give you an advance warning. He was not the most philo-Semitic person around. In general, he held a disdain for Eastern religions, uh, Judaism in particular. So these passages are a bit rough, but they're important for us historically in order to be able to advance the antiquity of the lighting of Shabbat candles. So bear with me with the rough reading. And he speaks about Shabbat, and one of the striking things over here is that he speaks about the success of Jewish missionaries. Yes, Jewish missionaries, if you can believe such a thing. In today's world, that is not a thing. But back in antiquity, this was a thing. And uh, whether he made a distinction between uh, early Christians and Jews, that is, uh, St. Augustine wanted to put forward that, uh, that debate. But historically speaking, it doesn't seem that he made such a difference. Here's his quote about Shabbat. All of the following translations are coming from Menachem Stern's book, and they have been abridged for topical purposes and for clarity. Along with the other superstitions of civil theology, Seneca also censures the sacred institutions of the Jews, especially the Sabbath. Their practice is inexpedient, because by introducing one day of rest in every seven, they lose in idleness almost a seventh of their life. And by failing to act in times of urgency, they often suffer loss. Meanwhile, the customs of this accursed race have gained such influence that they are now received throughout the world. The vanquished have given laws to their victors. The Jews, however, are aware of the origin and meaning of their rights. The greater part of the people goes through a ritual not knowing why they do so. In another epistle about morality, he belittles Shabbat candles. Precepts are commonly given as to how the God should be worshipped. But let us forbid lamps to be lighted on the Sabbath. Since the gods do not need light, neither do men take pleasure in soot. There's a lot to unpack within Seneca's comments, but maybe we'll leave that for a topic of another video. But what's important over here is the topic at hand, which is lighting of Shabbat candles and observing the Sabbath. There are a number of takeaways to talk about over here. A, the Jews observe Shabbat, even outside of the land of Israel. B, they lit Shabbat candles. C, it seems that Jewish practice had extended beyond the Jewish people, and even non-Jews all throughout the Roman world were lighting Shabbat candles as some form of spirituality. And D, Jews knew the origin of the practices and were not engaged in blind ritual. Another non-Jewish writer, Roman writer, to mention the Shabbat candles was the Stoic poet Perseus. Perseus was a contemporary of Seneca and died about the same time, although he was much younger. Perseus sets out to defend his view that all men are slaves to feeling and emotions. He hones in on the Jews to explain how they are slaves to superstition. He writes the following. But when the day of Herod, which scholars have interpreted to mean the Sabbath, comes round, when the lamps wreathed with violets and arranged round the greasy windowsills have spat forth their thick clouds of smoke, when the floppy tuna tails are curled round the dishes of red ware, and the white jars are swollen out with wine, you silently twitch your lips, turning pale at the Sabbath of the circumcised. Even though this writing is about 1,960 years before modernity, we still see a number of practices that are observed today, such as lighting the Shabbat candles, eating fish on Shabbat, using your finery, your most elegant dining wear, be it for your uh, 
eating or drinking. In this case, he was using Roman redware, which is a fine Roman pottery, and uh, the whiteware for the drinking of wine, and also to have flowers surrounding your house. It is quite common today when you go into Jewish houses on the Sabbath that you'll actually see flowers sitting in a vase. What's even more important is that we see that these writings were about 130 years before the writing down of the Mishnah. So we actually see the living oral component, the tradition of the Jewish people. So we can see the institution of lighting Shabbat candles is indeed very ancient. Can we actually trace back when? It's impossible to say, but we do know that it is a very old, old custom. The rabbis of the Talmud connect it to a verse in Isaiah chapter 58 which speaks about delighting in the Sabbath day and they interpret delighting or Oneg Shabbat as it's known as enjoying oneself and one cannot possibly enjoy himself sitting in the dark. So the rabbis sought to connect this idea of delighting in Shabbat to the lighting of Shabbat candles. Another reason that's given is to honor the Shabbat and one way to honor the Shabbat is to have uh, your house made out in its finest and that would include having illumination within one's house. It's also debated in rabbinic sources whether this was already something coming from the time of Moses or was a later development. What's interesting on the historical side is that there were a number of Jewish groups from the Second Temple period going into the Middle Ages that rebelled against this concept. This was strictly a Pharisaic slash rabbinic Jewish custom. Uh, even today we have the uh, Karaite sect which do not light candles before Shabbat. In fact, they would go as far as to extinguish a light that was lit on Shabbat because they interpret the Torah literally when it says that one should not light a fire within any of their dwelling places. So Rabbinic Judaism interprets that verse that on Shabbat itself, obviously you can't do that, but before Shabbat you're allowed to light and it's allowed to burn through. Now, this was also the held, the held belief of the Samaritans and possibly of the Sadducees in the Second Temple period. During the Middle Ages, this is actually very problematic for rabbinic leaders as the vast majority of Jews at that time were following uh, Karaite rites and they went to battle against this. In fact, the earliest source we have for saying a bracha is coming from the Goanic period from Rabbi Amram Gon's Siddur, which just predates Rav Sadia a little bit. And other uh, halakhic decisors jumped on that and today it's absolutely the custom. We know in halakha that the blessings that were established, most of them are coming, most if not all, are coming from the Anshe Knesset Hagadola, the men of the Great Assembly, as per the Rambam. But it seems that the actual custom of saying a blessing on Shabbat candles was not universally accepted as per the uh, Siddur of Rabbi Sadia Gaon until a little after him. So everything that we've spoke about here is in normative rabbinic rite. Uh, it is a Pharisaic slash rabbinic uh, interpretation of the law. Those who interpreted the Torah literally, the Samaritans, the Sadducees, and the Karaites, actually did the exact opposite and, and they would not light Shabbat candles. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, if you got benefit out of that, please make sure to give a like and subscribe. Thumbs up helps the algorithm. And you can check me out on my other social media accounts, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course YouTube. And if you're interested in uh, booking my services as a tour guide, if you're in the land of Israel, or if you would like a lecture on topics similar to these, please check me out at www.masoratravel.com.